best advice I got from my parents was work hard and be a good person. And I failed miserably because working hard and being a good person, it's nice to be a good person, but and then I fell in love with personal development. First, it was a drug for me. And then I'm like, where is this stuff in my entire life? So I dedicated myself to teaching the highest level communication skills out there in the world because I didn't know anybody teaching them. And I also knew that the majority of stuff that's out there in the world gets people drugged and excited, but doesn't get them to do anything. Welcome to the I Own It Podcast with Ben Reinberg. All right. We are live today from Alliance Consolidated's West Coast office. We're out of the uh, I Own It studios in Laguna Beach, and we are in Newport Beach today at our West Coast headquarters. So uh, welcome, everyone. You know, we just keep racking them up and knocking them down this week. We've had incredible guests the last few weeks, and today is no different. Uh, Gentlemen we're about to chat with is an author. He is a speaker, he is a coach, and he is one of a kind. And Michael Burnoff, welcome to the Ben Reinberg I Own It show. It, we're very grateful you could join us. Thank you so much for uh, having flexibility in your schedule with the uh, technical difficulties we had in the, in the studio today. And uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You're ab- absolutely welcome. Thrilled to be here, Ben. It's an honor. And uh, let's see what we can do to impact some lives. Uh, absolutely. So... What inspired you to dedicate your career on being a professional motivator and coach? Got it. Well, you know, what's interesting is that's how the world would see me as a, as a motivator and a coach, which is great, great words. Um, the biggest reason I do what I do, I, I'm going to put myself in a different category. I'm, I'm a communicator. I, I lived a very, very average life the most of my life. That's why I wrote the, wrote the book Average Sucks for a reason. It's not to promote my book. Just I grew up very simple life. And when I got involved with business, because I got like a lot of people, you know, you get into business, the best advice I got from my parents was work hard and be a good person. And I failed miserably because working hard and being a good person, it's nice to be a good person. But, and then I fell in love with personal development. First, it was a drug for me. And then I'm like, where is this stuff in my entire life? So I dedicated myself to teaching the highest level communication skills out there in the world because I didn't know anybody teaching them. And I also knew that the majority of stuff that's out there in the world gets people drugged and excited, but doesn't get them to do anything. Like they'll read books, they get excited, they're going to go grind and I'm going to figure it out. But there really wasn't a manual on how to get people to take action and get what they wanted out of life because my parents' advice was work hard and be a good person. And that didn't get me first class seats on airlines. That didn't give me the concierge tour at Disney that I get now. That didn't give me investment portfolios that I have now. It got me frustration. So that is my biggest thing is there's a lot of people out there that don't have the information and I make it my purpose to share it. What is the information that people need to get out of the way of themselves and create success from from your experience and, and what you teach? Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, most people haven't learned how to communicate with themselves. I mean, at the end of the day, like they use words. Like, so, okay, I'm, I'm in Utah the other night, right? And I'm walking out of a restaurant and this lady's like, these two ladies come out. They're probably like late 50s, early 60s coming out going, did you have drinks in there? I don't drink anymore, but it's fine if you do. It just I doesn't work for my what I want with my life, right? So I'm like, no, I didn't. And then one lady's all normal, like acting normal. The other lady's, well, I'm going through a divorce right now. Life is hard. And I said, actually, it's not. It's harder than you want it to be. And I realized in her idea that life is hard gives her a hard life. By changing one word for it's harder than I want it to be as it changes. So Pretty much everything we do comes down to language and communication because the words we use create picture sounds and feelings inside of us. The same tech that I teach people, Netflix, CNN, Fox, ABC, Instagram, all of them use so they can get like $11 a month from you or get you to watch TV. All of us have access to, yet no one is teaching them how to do. So if you want a better life, you first got to change your communication, period. Understood. You talk a lot about self-limiting beliefs, okay? Psychologically speaking, what makes them so compelling in our minds? And what do you see are the best ways to overcome the ones that are holding us back from specific goals that we want to achieve? Okay. Well, our biggest issue we have in life is um, we have what's called, and we, we just create a life for ourselves that gets in the way of getting what we want. So I'm not 
limiting beliefs is how I would discuss it and I'd share with the world because that's how most people would view it. But at the end of the day, we have a psychological profile that we're addicted to that we do on a regular basis because years ago it was a good idea. Now it became our reality. Like, let me ask you a question. How long have you been an entrepreneur? Uh, 28 years, 28, 29 years. Nice, nice. Young guy like me. So uh, right. 28 years you've been, been, been an entrepreneur. What did you do prior? I was a, I'm a CPA. I worked okay. for an accounting firm and okay. realized that I was an entrepreneur. I was on an audit. And well, whose yep. show is this? Are you interviewing me? I guess no, now man, this man, is man, fine. Man. No, I like it. Let me add value. So when I was, I was on an audit I was in, I was in New York city. I was in Manhattan. I worked late hours and the guy was a billionaire and he pulled me aside and he said, when are you getting out of accounting? And I said, what Wake do you mean? Call. What? Yeah, that was that was that was the turning point. He put me aside. And, you know, when you're 21, 22, however old I was, first of all, I, I've never been to New York City. It was my first time. I'm there on an audit. OK, it's like being in a foreign country for me. And then I'm with a guy who's this icon who's wildly successful. Yep. Uh, and he pulls me aside and says, when are you getting out of accounting? You're, and I said, what do you mean? I said, I don't understand. And he said, you're not much of an accountant. I go, why would you say it to me? I'm a young guy. I'm like, you're going to, you're going to kill my, my self-esteem. And he goes, no, no, that's not what I mean. What I mean is you're very entrepreneurial. You, how long are you going to be in accounting? Because this is not where your career is. I've already, I've talked to you enough over two weeks. I know that you're not, you're an entrepreneur. And it woke me up and I said, okay, well, what do I want to do? And long story short, uh, I realized commercial real estate to me, was the best way to, to produce wealth. I happened to stumble on a, a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And yeah, being, being and being motivated, I was, and I read Robert Kiyosaki, I said, you know what, he's right. If I could buy assets that produce cash flow, I can make this work and I can have a great life and, and great tax benefits. And here I am today, 28 years later, and. Uh, and have a great company and wonderful staff and i'm really proud of and and now we're doing this whole personal brand thing and this podcast awesome. so it's it's all coming together so to speak so yeah i started and someone had a kind of his words kind of pushed me in the water inspired me to say you can do this and he and coming from a guy of that status to say yeah. that to me had an impact on me it, it said to me michael it said you know what this is a guy who's been there, done it. If he's saying I could do it, I'm not going to argue with him. He might be right. So that's how, so, I, that's so how it's what, the re, I'm glad you brought that up because here, here's what we all do. We all get to a point in our lives where we say never again. Never mm -hmm. again am I work for someone else. Never again am I eat that shellfish again because I got food poisoning. Never again am I going to date that person. We usually go back for three, four more rounds. You know what I'm saying? Never am I going to do that again. And in that moment, we go, well, what do I want? And we build this like bridge of like what I don't want, what I don't want, what I do want, what I don't. And most people live between that. It becomes their identity. So what a lot of us are doing is it's not that we have a limiting belief. We have an outdated program going on. So like we were like, God, I like I, I, like I make 150 a year. I want to make 300. Dude, there was a point making 150 was a dream for you. You know what I'm saying? Not you. Oh, but absolutely. The person, right. So yeah. what happens is we need to realize that we're living an outdated model that we created and we built an identity for ourselves that keeps us stuck. So like I talk about in my book that I spent my entire life building a psychological profile as a hockey player that couldn't score goals because I was a defenseman. I literally pretended I couldn't. I did everything I could. I, I, I'm six foot seven. I was the tough. I would be, I would, I would hit you. I would do everything I could to not score. And then I'm 39 years old playing in a men's league. I'm like, why don't I score goals? I have a hard shot. And I go, I never actually wanted to be a goal scorer. So the next shift I go out, I score a goal. And I said to myself this, I said, very, very simply, I said, what do goal scorers do that I don't? You know what they do? They put the puck where the goalie's not. And I never thought of doing it. I got a goal. And now I get about two to three every game. I can I re-identified myself. And I realized, I think a lot of us, it's less that we have limiting beliefs. We lie to ourselves and we believe it because our right. inner voice is one we hear all the time. So we all lie to ourselves. We make up shit that we think is real and we tell ourselves it's real and we do it for a long period. And we even like recruit people to, to buy into it with us. Go, dude, dude, you know how hard it is to hire these days? Oh man, yeah, tell me why it's hard. And then like we all sell each other on it so we can make it hard so we can feel good about ourselves. 
Are you a big believer that words matter? Not only they matter, they're everything. Okay. Everything is language. I how do you, you? I can't even tell you one thing that isn't language. How do you resolve the inner voice? The you know, I always say you have to work on yourself inside to be able to project outside yep. to become better in relationships, business, yep. you know, you name it in life. Really, how do you? How do you? How do you suggest people work on their inner self so they can be well, better on the outside? Good, good question. So when you say something like that, it makes sense to people that it makes sense to. And what I mean by that is it makes a lot of sense to explain to someone that already understands personal development to say you got to work on the inner game or inner voice. For an outsider, let's say my dad. My dad's an aerospace engineer, never picked up a personal development book in his life. How do you explain it to that guy? So what we'd have to explain to my dad is we'd have to explain to him that like when he says something, it creates something inside of the body. So you've got to figure out which words you're choosing to use. Like I went to my daughter's school the other day and the teacher didn't, they're, they're nervous when we show up, my wife and I, we're type A and we show up, they got, <laughs> they're scared, right? Not well, now that, you're, you're six, seven too. Yep. So yep. between being type A and six, seven, I mean, that's, that's, yep. that's a, like you, they could probably hear the footsteps. Coming. They hear the footsteps. And I just let her know, I said, listen, be very careful what you say to my daughter and tell her that you have anxiety about homework because then that sends off a signal to my daughter. My daughter doesn't have anxiety about her homework. My daughter's uncomfortable with the homework. If we want to make it anxiety, we'll make it a real problem. But the question is, is it anxiety? There, so you understand marketing. There's upper level and lower level explanations. So are we depressed or are we having a bad day? Those are different levels. Are we suicidal or are we very frustrated with life? And we've got to recognize how we use words to explain things to ourselves. So you have to recognize like people should realize like, it's almost like with a weapon, you got to like go to classes to like be, it's appropriate to use it. You should get probably training if you're going to use a sword or a gun or have a stiletto or like have like, you should probably get training if you're going to carry that. Well, with words, we should get training and realize the things we say to people have a massive impact. That billionaire guy said something change your trajectory who know he didn't know what he was dealing with you could have been bipolar manic he could have sent you off a cliff luckily he had the right guy at the right time and said the right thing to you but dude if you had crazy tendencies that recommendation might have been the wrong one so we have to be careful the words we use but not be scared of them so i don't know if that answers your question but i get excited talking about this stuff yeah it's 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 Perfect. I mean, yeah, with that gentleman, he was reading me for two weeks. So I think he okay. knew the situation, what he could and couldn't do. And I think that's important to be able to listen and really understand where people are coming from. You know, as you, as people start to get it, okay, yep. what does the personal growth curve look like in the people that you coach? It, it, it's quick. Um, it, it's quick when they actually get it. So here's the problem people have with coaching. It's like Mr. Miyagi, it's wax on, wax off. Once they learn to trust themselves and have real faith, like I wouldn't hire this guy if I didn't believe that I'd help him. Once they learn, if Michael recommends that I do it because his reputation is on the line, those students go through things rapidly. Those are the athletes, the UFC fighters we work with, the, the influencers online that are now boxers that I've worked on mindset. You can do your homework on who they are, okay? So what's interesting about that is when we work with people that are effective, they allow me to help them with their biochemistry. So Ben, this is what we all do as human beings. If you're in commercial real estate, you're a banker, you're a mom, a dad, we are all really drug dealers. And what I mean by that is we are using words that are changing the biochemistry of another human being's body with every word we speak. And here's the thing, my friends that work for Netflix and the media, they, do, they know what they're up to. I know what we're up to, but most parents do not realize, or business owners, that the words that they choose change the chemical biochemistry of another human being, which changes their reaction. So like, I'll tell you like one of my most powerful things that I've learned over the years, um, have you ever told someone you're proud of them? All the time, I tell my kids, I tell my, I tell my employees constantly. I mean, I, I don't know, I can't remember a day in my career where it's not someone that works for me or a resource where I say I'm proud of them or, or okay. thank you or I'm grateful for you. There's cool. always something out of my mouth like that. Okay. So let, let me teach you something super cool. Do you want to empower your people even more? Absolutely. Do you want to empower your kids to the highest level? 
Absolutely. So watch this craziness. I'm going to show All you right, right. now. It's cool. I, I, I so, you know, everyone knows me for my blue pen. I got, I got my. Get your pen out. You know, pa you know Pavlov. You know yes. Pavlov. Yes. The Pavlov, like when I say Pavlov, you start drooling because I know, like, I'm, I'm drooling right Pavlov now. Pavlov <laughs> makes me makes me salivate. Right. It's, get, it's so, getting hot in here. When when you say Pavlov to someone, they mm -hmm. salivate. But Pavlov is like ring a bell and you do something for me. So what most people don't recognize is they're trading as marketers a dopamine or a cortisol hit with people. I get you excited or I get you scared. And this is where most marketing, dude, if you don't buy that property now, someone else could have it. Cortisol hit. Two weeks, you worry about it at night. Dude, you know how much money we can make on this property? 45 minute high from dopamine after the alcohol wears off your board. This is how you change someone's life. So when we tell our kids we're proud of them, we're actually limiting them. So let's let that sink in for a minute and I want you to okay. think about it. Hold on. Okay, hold on, Michael. Do I, We're do limiting. I, do, do okay. I? I got. Do I need a tissue for this okay. exercise? No, you're okay. not doing anything wrong. Okay, it's good. Beauty. You're doing it. Everyone else does. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Watch how cool this is. Okay. So, serotonin is the drug that you feel when you're mm -hmm. proud of what you just did. So, what I do with kids and my daughter as well, because I used to screw this up. I used to say, "Maya, I'm so proud of you." Tara, I'm proud of you. Instead, I say, "Maya, Tara, what you just did." you should be proud of yourself. Now, the second you tell an employee you should be proud of you, you handed them the ability to drip their own serotonin and they don't need you anymore to tell them. You have now just empowered them to empower themselves. They might leave you one day and go on and start another competitor company. Your kids, you want, and that's okay. Because guess what? That's our thing in this world. But what I'm getting at is, why would you limit someone? So if I told you, this, feel the difference, Ben. Ben, dude, great show, dude, I'm proud of you. Versus Ben, this thing you're doing, you should be proud of yourself. You feel it different, it. don't you? Oh yeah, it's totally different. What great, what a great piece of advice that is. And uh, I hope everyone out there learns from that. I know I just did, I love that, so thank you. I don't know what made me tell you, but that's the thing and that's what we do. And well, I, I, I'm a big proponent that there's always a reason why people get together just like you're on our show. So. Maybe this, is, this is the reason. This is the reason. So what let's let's talk about what are the habits and rituals that you typically recommend to people you work with? And uh and and those habits and rituals, what make them so effective? Okay. And I wish I had that for you, and I'd love to give you that list, and I don't. So what I have is um habits and rituals are what we, what makes up our life. And one of the biggest things is I tell people really not to fight who it is they are. Okay. And they have to realize that everything that they're doing, they're doing for a purpose and they may be using it in an incorrect way. So one of the rituals I teach people to understand is that everything that you do has a positive intention. So people like to beat themselves up for being lazy or being, um, or being a quitter. And I say lazy is wonderful. Like I, I think lazy is a gift because most of us entrepreneurs, we get mad at lazy people, but us entrepreneurs go on a vacation and we don't know how to turn it off for the first three days. So what if I told you, don't use lazy at the office, learn how to use it on vacation. It's not a bad thing. It needs to be used correctly. So I'm a, a creature of the ritual of a reframe, meaning how could you reframe everything you do or everything you say to make it better? So quitting, you think quitting is bad. Well, listen, you might quit Little League, maybe think it's bad. But if you can quit Little League, down the road, you might be able to quit smoking or quit drinking or you may be able to quit a bad relationship. So I believe that there is a way to reframe everything that we do. So one of the greatest rituals I teach people is how do you reframe your day and make it better than it was? And one of the greatest ways you can make it better is go, that was a horrible day. I'm not going to repeat that. Okay, we're done with that. That was already done. Like I teach people the ritual of uh, time lapsing. What I mean by that is um, people will say to me, Michael, I do this. And I said, no, up till now. So I teach people how to say up till now or in the past. And we put things you don't want in the past and things you do want in the future and in the now. So one of the rituals I, I, I get people to say is to stop making it a global thing for themselves. So instead of like, hey, Michael, three rituals I have is I wake up in the morning and I drink lemon water. Yes, I do. Yes, I get up in the morning. I do activities. Yes, we already know this. You can find this stuff online. But advanced level psychology is take a look at what you just said and did you say that as effectively as you could? So when people say, Michael, I'm always lazy, not true. Up till now, laziness has been a habit. Moving forward, here's what I plan to do. So putting it in a timeline is one of the habits that I have. 
let's talk about what's behind you. Uh, yep. av average sucks. Yep. We can what scan it. My team can scan it. I, I love the book. I love the title. And oh, I love that. It's a great blue, by the way. What, Thank you. What does average sucks mean? Like, and what, what, what should your readers yep. obtain from this, this gem that you wrote? Yeah. So I wrote it for people like me with ADD that can read real quickly. So I wrote it to be read. I, I gave it to a guy on the plane recently. Uh, I met a boxer, like a box, a really great guy. And we're sitting in the plane. He sat across from me and I gave it to him. He finished it on a three hour flight to Nashville. So it was, it's very easy to read and it's very easy to use. So average sucks is a battle cry for my childhood. And what I mean by that is, did you grow up middle class, Ben? Uh, yes. Okay. So did like everyone we know. Right. Okay. Right. Meaning, and, and there's always a speaker that goes, dude, I was broke and I was homeless. And like, I don't relate to that because I wasn't broken homeless. Because you were broken homeless, you motivate me. Or the other speaker who was rich. I grew up right down the middle. So average sucks is about two things. It's about this positioning socially that was developed in 1940s and 50s and the concept of middle class lower middle and upper that did not exist because i grew up with little house in the prairie did you watching yes, the show i'll admit it i'm yes. a i'm a masculine I, I, guy yeah, look I, I that was one of them but it wasn't my favorite like i i might turn it off i was i was more of like a dallas or like love boat fantasy island that i got it <laughs> i got it i watched those things too but if you remember little house in the prairie there was sure. broken four and that was it Right. And the goal mm -hmm. was if you lived long enough on the prairie and you got through the hard times, eventually you got a house in town. Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with toughen it out. We've been sold on a concept that a average is OK. There's even a book right now. I can't believe it. I got to find the author and interview them called The New Awesomeness is Average. Like my goal is never to be like anybody else. So my license plate says average sucks. I get stopped all the time by people They're like, hey, dude, great, great, great license plate. I'm like, do you know what it means? So, yeah, it'd be better than everyone else. No. What it means is you have an average, the same average you had 28 years ago when the guy stopped you and said, are you okay with what you're doing? And most people do not realize that if I were to call Mark Zuckerberg, who knows everything you're doing, he would know how many times you spelled a word, probably knows how many times you're intimate in a year, how many times you ate things you shouldn't eat. They know everything. So if we were to categorize it in the last three to five years, you probably have an average of how you lived. Average sucks really does suck. It's that you have an average and your average controls your behavior. The book is about accepting that your average is your daily thing you do. And here's the cool part. You don't have to work as hard as you're working to be who you are. Average sucks is how to stop the invisible force that holds you back and start getting the life you want. Because if you're going to have an average, it might as well be the one you want, not the one you're living. Well, and when I read your book, uh, what resonated with me was you're my the challenge. one that read it. I knew somebody. Read I, it. I'm the only one. So when they say there's one sale, you're you're talking to them. Uh, you and the guy, the, the yeah. guy, the guy who runs the I own it show. Yeah. With that being said, okay, what I got out of it, and it, it really it made me think. And then I saw a video of yours right afterwards, and kind of talked about it. Was I went back to my childhood? I, I went back to my father taking the train to downtown Chicago in a blue suit and a red tie every day and seeing that life and saying, I don't want that life. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, I'm not doing that. And what came out of your book was all this emotion and feelings of my childhood. Like, this is what I saw. And to me, that was average. And I said, you know, yeah, I grew up lower middle class, you can call it. Uh, didn't come from money. Uh, I started making money at the age of eight, uh, selling cigarettes in a bar in Highwood, Illinois. Don't tell my parents know anyway. So I had a fake idea. I had a fake idea. Right. But we all did. But right. So so with that being said, when I was reading your book, I had all these emotions coming through me because I could go back and say, like, well, why did I do the things as a little kid? You know, and a lot of it is I never wanted to be average. Okay. Cause I felt like I grew up in this average, you know, no, and the and when we were kids, Michael, one of the things I saw was that, you know, you go. You get educated. If you can go to college, great. You work your butt off. Maybe you pay for college or maybe your parents can afford it. You, you get through college. What do you do? You get a job. So I got a job in accounting, right? And that was that's what you did. You build a career and you have a family. Maybe you have kids. You get a house. And that's what 
the American dream was. And then I think all of a sudden entrepreneurialism came into play. It was already out there, but it wasn't really talked about like it is today. And I think that's the difference is, is saying to yourself, okay, who do you want to be? And what's your mission in life? And, and, and are you going to be average doing it? Or are you going to be obsessed and say, I'm going to be more than just average. I'm going to be the best that I can be at something. I think that was my mindset at an early age and why I realized that I'm an entrepreneur. And I'm sure it's the same thing with you as a coach. You probably realize like you're not average. You're an exceptional coach and you have great messages. It's a really good book. If anyone wants to pick it up, it's a quick read. It's got a lot of things. I, I think I, one thing I can assure people, a great book, I can assure people you will reflect on something that happened in your life when you read this book. That I can assure you because I could I could see what it did for me. And I'm sure all of us, we all have challenges and issues in our life. It will naturally bring it out when you read it. So great book. I, great job. I appreciate the uh, the endor endorsement of it. And Look, after, that, hey, good plugging. When I when I wrote when I wrote it, it took me nine years to write the book, and and I'm sure you know my my buddy Tucker Max who was helping me with the uh, to get the book done, his publishing company at the time, and he's like, "What are you waiting for?" And I'm like, "I had the book in my head, and it took me. This was a, a very powerful moment about getting the book done. I identified the majority of my life as someone that wasn't good at school, so I wanted to beat this thing. I was going to be an author. I was going to prove it to the world. I was going to get this book." done. I was going to figure this out. And, and my friend Brad had me on his podcast. And I remember looking at him, I said, Brad, let me ask you a question. What is a 41 year old man that does well in his life? What can that guy do that travels all over the world? And then it dawned on me when I left, like the wrong guy was writing the book. A nine year old boy was trying to write the book versus a 40 year old man at the time was trying to write the book. So I said, wait a second. I travel all over the world. I've made millions and millions of dollars. I got a great life. I, I got a great wife. I got great kids. Why isn't that guy writing the book? And three days later, I got the book done because here's what was interesting. I went to my wife and I said, Deborah, will you help me finish this? It's 99% done. She went through it with me. We got the last little pieces, not writing it, but just organized. Boom, it's the publisher. 50,000 copies later in a couple of years, all because the wrong person was doing it. And I believe most people are running their life as a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, an 18-year-old, and they have not accepted to look in the mirror and go, dude, look at what I've been through. Maybe it's, I've been through a divorce. Maybe I've succeeded in raising a child. Maybe I got through a loss of a parent or a child or look at what I've done. What can this human being do? And I think most people have not harnessed their current self to get the life they want. They keep on using an outdated version of themselves from years ago. So when I got the book done, I, the first night somebody goes, Hey dude, I loved your book. I read it. And I go, dude, it's been out three hours. I goes, he goes, what do I do now? I said, I don't know. Read it again. I had no idea what to tell him. I'm like, it took nine years to write something that you finished in three hours. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of us were slowing down our success because we're trying, we're handing it off to the wrong version of ourselves. You're a badass today. You're all killers. You, you've done amazing things in this world. Maybe you should look in the mirror and go, it's time to make decisions based on who I am today, not based on who I was. So you're saying it's okay to accept yourself. Look in your mirror, reflect back and say, you know what? Here's who I am. I'm proud of myself and yeah. I'm going to use this to fuel me into whatever mission or, or accomplishments I want moving forward. So what, if you're going to start so, a new business, do you want to yeah. start it as a, do you want to start it as a middle-class kid growing up in the suburbs of Chicago? Or do you want to start it off as this incredible human being that lives in one of the wealthiest communities in the world that has built a commercial uh, real estate empire that has tons of employees that's raising his kids. That's an example pillar in his community. I would ask that guy to build your next business, not an eight year old child that's trying to keep his daddy happy. Well said, well said, you know, being a full-time coach like you are, what did it, what is it, what did it take to create the level of success you had? Like, what do you look at your career? Because obviously you teach people how to become high performers, improve, uh, get rid of some of those blockages. What did you do to become who you are today? Interesting. It was, it was literally a moment like that. And there, there's a moment we get in our lives. My buddy, John, uh, it's, it's crazy. People come to our lives like conduits. I remember sitting at Oregano's, this restaurant here in Scottsdale. Have you been to uh -huh. Oregano's? It's just like little, I have a long time ago. Yeah, it's a cool little place. Highly unrecommended for Italian food. Highly recommended for good food at a good price, and it's nice. It's it's like your Portillo's. Does that make sense? Yes. It, it, yeah. It is what yeah. it is. I'm speaking Chicago, yeah. right? Yeah. So yep. John says to me, he's like, "What are you waiting for? 
it was that moment like you had. He goes, dude, you're sitting here talking to me about helping our insurance company out with something. Do you realize what you've done for me, Michael? Do you realize how you've shifted my life? And he let me know and he goes, maybe someone hasn't told you, so I'm gonna tell you what you've done for me. And he goes, I'm about to move to the Philippines and start a call center based on what you've shared with me. And um, years ago, I would never have had the courage to do it. These are our little talks we've had and thank you. I know I didn't hire you to do that, but thank you. He goes, are you, he goes, I can't be your friend anymore if you don't accept your purpose. This will be our last meeting. And I'll never forget, I don't think I've even shared that on a podcast anywhere. And I mentioned it a little bit in the book, but literally John said that to me and that was a wake up call. And it was a peak emotional experience that, that shifted me. And that was one of the moves that got me into coaching. Then your question comes up, when do you decide to separate yourself from the masses? And that's when you decide you're going to be the best at what it is you do. So that comes down to a decision to start letting people know that you're going to be great and you're going to be one of the best in the world at what it is that you do. And a lot of people say it, very few people back it up. I'm going to tell you that if you can say it and back it up and say it for a few months, you're probably going to separate yourself from everyone. Because I told my daughter this, I said, I said, when you start figure skating, because she's a competitive figure skater now, yeah. I said, all you have to do is be here a year from now. 99% of these people, they wouldn't have quit. They're just not going to do what you're willing to do. And if you take on coaching and you hire a coach to help you, you've already separated yourself. You start competing, you're one of the top 1% in the world. Then we can figure out where to go from there. So all you have to do is be in the game a year from now, and you're going to be in the top 1% in the world if you play the game. And you know this from real estate. You know yeah, it's that showing, It's showing up. You got to show year. up. You got to be one persistent. Year. One year. If yeah. you stick it out and do what you need to do for one year, you've already separated yourself from 99% of the people that will never do that. Well, and then it leads to failure. I mean, especially in my business, it's no, 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 yes. And so when you tell people, hey, you got to be persistent, you got to show up and you got to stick it out, like you tell your daughter, you, you know, when she fails at something, let's say she's doing a, here, I'll, I'll show you my knowledge. I'm from Chicago. I'm, I'm in the Midwest with snow and ice. She's doing a, uh, a double axle, right? She learns yeah. pretty good, huh? Good. Uh, okay. Uh, that's all right. I should go see her. So yeah. she does it. She does a I'm sure she is. She does a double axle and she falls right on her ass, right? Or something. Yep. Or she, yep. or she, whatever the scoring is, I'm not into, but let's yep. say she gets like half a point or a point off her yep. score. Okay. Or a judge like treats her, doesn't like, she doesn't like the way she's treated with the judge and she feels this failure. What do you suggest people do to overcome that? Because you have to fail, it creates success. Uh, it builds great thick skin, especially in my business. What do you recommend to your daughter and the folks out there that they're going to fail, but how they can keep pushing forward, like you said, to get to that one year mark or whatever the Got mark it. is you need to. So this is interesting. So we let's start at the beginning. So with my daughter, with Maya, um, I remember one day, I remember vividly this. I told her, Maya, go out there and win her first competition. She starts walking away and look confused. I brought her back. I said, no, 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 come back, Maya. I'm like, I can't give someone a program to do something they've never done before. You cannot ask someone to win if they've never experienced winning. So I told her something else. I said, Maya, go show off what we've been practicing. Then she lit up and she knew what to do. So she goes out, takes first place. Now she knows what that's like. So we don't play to win. We play to perform. Does that make sense? And most yes. people are trying to win. We don't win all the time, but we can perform well. Part of performing well is not just on the ice. It's how you respond afterwards that the judges are watching. So there was a girl that she, three levels up, she beat, okay? And she took first place. And that girl would not get on the podium of second place. She would not get on. It took a parent to like mm. put her on the podium to do it. <laughs> and it, it, was, it was fascinating. And I, and I realized that a lot of us play the game of win or fail. Mm -hmm. The question is, how did you perform? So whenever you give yourself two options in life, get the deal, don't get the deal, you can be miserable half the time, but you can always be happy with improving your performance. So one of the things I do when I work with fighters and I work with athletes and any, any type of uh, behavior on that is we talk about performance. Instead of winning and losing, we talk about how we performed. So how did we perform is different than how did we lose. So with her girlfriends, my daughter, she wants them to, to win, but she's totally willing to be better than them. 
I want you to think about what I just said. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to process that. Say that one more time. That was she interesting. She wants her friend to win, but she's willing to outperform them and win herself. Okay. I want the best for you, but I'm going to outperform you, and hopefully you do your best also. So let's okay. think of the word performance. So as a business owner, as a salesperson, if we separate failure, and we don't call it failure, and we talk about performance, how do you perform on the phone? Like, it's not that you failed and didn't get the deal. Your communication is not as good as the other guys. Your performance is not strong enough yet. So if we're just developing our performance level, you know who gets the big deals? Dude, that guy, that billionaire, who's probably a gazillionaire by now, that changed your life, whatever his name is, we'll call him Bobby Axelrod, right? Who came mm -hmm. into your life. He is a performer. He yes. performs at the highest level. So there's a few things we need to get better at. So it's not that you failed. Your communication and confidence is not as strong as it could be. How do we get better at those areas? Because if you call it failure, nicely speaking, you're F-U-C-K-E-D fucked. You will not do well. Okay. Right. And I know we can say that on here, but you fucked. But the point no, is- you can't. Yeah. But the, I was going to say it anyways. But the point <laughs> is, you're not going to win. So I realized one of the first things I do with athletes is I get rid of winning and losing and we perform as a winner. That's how that works. So I can go deeper on this, but this is no, a very- you, you hit, I mean, communication to me equals wealth. Communication is so important. And I talk about it frequently on this show as well as- Failure is uh, a bullshit drama. concept. Yeah. But failure is a bullshit. Yeah. There's, only yeah. fa there's no failure. There's only feedback. So if you did not get the deal, it's because of the way you communicated the deal. If you did not win, the way you communicated with the judges, you lost. If you are Mike Tyson, you communicated with who you were going against that they are going to lose. Mike Tyson was an expert communicator and a master hypnotist. He killed you before he entered the ring and he mm -hmm. had every tactic under the sun. Read his book. It's amazing. Now, he, well, let's, let's, let's transition into that because one thing that Mike Tyson that I really value, okay, and not a lot of people really talk about is the art of persuasion, which you oh, talk about influence. a lot. Yeah. And he was an influencer and he would persuade you, you know, he'd be up at the, at the weigh in. Okay. And I see this a lot with the UFC fighters, maybe even some of your clients where, you know, the intimidation game starts and Mike Tyson was, he had a crazy side to him. People knew that he was going to run right through you. And part of that, his mental game was incredible, incredible and persuasion. So let's dive into that. So sometimes people think, that persuasion has this sleazy, you know, connotation to it, right? How how do you get over that and and become a great great at persuading? Persuading is great for relationships. It's great for business. It's great for teaching people. So educate our audience on persuasion and, and let's dive in. Let's do a deep dive on yeah, how this is it can be, be used in a positive way. So let's talk about influence for a second and persuasion. So. I believe influence. I believe we're always influencing people. So when I go for a run in the morning, mm -hmm. I'm influencing people to laugh at me. I'm influencing people to say to themselves, I'm a loser. I'm not running. And I'm influencing people to put the running shoes on and go. When you're smoking a cigarette, you're influencing people. When you're overweight, you're influencing people. When you go to Starbucks, you're influencing people. When you drive into the McDonald's, you're telling other people it's okay. We're always influencing people. So here's the thing, all of you that don't think you're doing it, you're influencing 24 seven, seven days a week. Being broke is influencing people to be broke. Period. So we're always influencing people. That is an important thing. So here's what I believe influence is. Let's say we're playing golf. And I, it's kind of funny. If you go to YouTube and you type in Tiger Woods 2016, uh, forgive me, 1996 hole-in-one Phoenix Open, you'll see yeah. me walking behind him uh, with this little parabolic <laughs> mic because I work for ESPN for 75 bucks a day um, doing this. Is it fair that Tiger Woods uses the right club at the right time to get a hole-in-one? Yeah, I'm asking, yeah. is it? Yeah, absolutely. He is knows something other people don't know. So what influence is, is the ability to help someone else make a decision that they already wanted to make. Manipulation is making someone do what you want them to do. So if you've got a product or a service, an opportunity or an idea, and it's a good idea for them, influencing them to know it's a good idea for them, that's influence. Manipulation is getting someone to do what you want them to do where there's no benefit for them. So what we have to do as people is most people have trouble making decisions. So our job is to remind them that they're capable of making one. So part of influence is letting them know. So if I'm out running and I'm not talking to people and that person decides to put their gym shoes on and run, 
that's part of influence. So I could take this anywhere you want to go. This is my background. If anyone would ask what I do, I'm a master influencer and I change words for people to get them to do different things, like little words that shift people's perspective. So give, give, give me an example. Okay. So um, pick an industry, pick a place, give me anything. I'll take it anywhere you want to go. Uh, let's say commercial real estate, my love. I love it. Very good. So give me an area that All gets right, I'll, hung I'll, up. I'll, uh, let's say uh, uh, we're, in, we're in the medical property business. Okay. okay. So let's say you're in a lease negotiation with a tenant okay. yep. and you're struggling to get them to understand that you are saving them money and you're providing a benefit. And in exchange for that benefit, you want to have a stable cash flow in terms of maybe a long-term lease. Maybe okay. there's security deposits, guarantees. So you are saving a tenant money and in exchange, you want stability in your income stream for your property. Okay, very good. So this is a negotiation right now that we're looking to do. So you yes. want them to put down some money and sign a longer contract, correct? Yeah, sign a longer term lease. That's correct. What's the benefit for them? Benefit for them is twofold. One, they save money. Two, they control the space, especially in inflation. You have regulated uh, uh, rent payments Okay. and they're not based off a CPI index. So, so you control the space, you save money, and, and you have stability for your tenant. Got it. Okay, so the first thing we've got to do is stop talking about the thing that they think we're going to talk about because they've already made their mind up about the thing we're going to talk about. When I used to walk into the Chess King when I was a kid, I wanted a pair of Cavaricci pants. I don't know if you remember these when we were kids. Yeah, of course. I wanted one. They said, hey, how can I help you? And I'm like, I nothing, even though I wanted a $90 pair of pants. If somebody would have said, hey, I bet there's something that you might not think that you can afford. Would you like a way to walk out of them with them here today? I probably would have bought pants and even signed it for a credit card, correct? But mm -hmm. they didn't say that. They kept on saying the same thing. No different than a parent saying to their kids, how was your day? And it's, we already have an auto response. So what I would do in that, that negotiation, I'd say, listen, let's take the lease off the table. And I'm going to ask you not to consider me a real estate agent or a real estate company. I want to consider myself as a partner because my job is if your business does better, this whole thing works better. So my job is to keep you focused and your eye on the ball. So everything we're about to discuss is designed to make it so you can focus on your business, have one less thing to focus on down the road, and you can have peace of mind. So this is an hour conversation that we're going to have. And every bit of what I'm about to explain to you is set up to make your business run better and to avoid long conversations down the road. Because if we do this differently every year, we have to have a two day conversation that cost your company money. I already know what your bottom line looks like. I already know how your company works. Every year having this conversation costs you tens of thousands of dollars every year by you and I and your accountants and everybody going over this. I'd like to save you time keep you running your business and become more profitable. So let's not have a negotiation. Let's have a coaching conversation on how we can have one conversation that will only have to happen every five or six years and save you 50 to $80,000 in additional conversations. Did you see what I just did? So yes. what's interesting is I don't want to have a negotiation with you. Let's put that over here. It's called spatial anchoring. So most real estate companies, um, I own it is very different. Most real estate companies are going to have a negotiation, a contract with you. I want to have a partnership conversation right now. And a partnership conversation is not you and I going in an LLC together is how do we help your company make the most amount of money possible? We need to make this as simple as possible and keep you doing what you're doing. Medical sales, getting people coming into your practice. So I want you to see ourselves that way. So what I'm doing is I'm not having that conversation. So I'll give you an example. Um, do your kids do martial arts ever? Yep, sure. They, okay, they, they, they went to karate or anything? Yeah, they did. I mean, they're in, they're in their 20s, but uh, okay. my, my old, both my boys did uh, karate. My oldest one did karate for a long okay. time. Okay, so what did you pay for karate monthly? Oh, I, I, who knows? I mean, it was a weekly basis on Saturdays. Who knows? It could have been like 60, the, 60, 70 bucks for that session, maybe. Okay, so let's, let's call it. 
Two hundred bucks a month seems, yeah. seems pretty fair, right? Yeah. So, sure. What I've learned over the years from an influence standpoint is to change what we're talking about. So what people would say, and I'm using martial arts as an example, now pay attention why I'm doing this. If you take it out of the conversation we're talking about and you talk about a different industry, people's guard comes down. Because when I explain commercial real estate to commercial real estate, but you don't get it. So I'm gonna talk about a different industry so then you can then reapply it back. So why don't you pretend I'm a gym owner, ask me how much it costs. So how much is it? How much uh, is your uh, gym membership for the month? I'm gonna say, Ben, that's the wrong question. Here's a better question. What would you like it to do for you? So you're basically, you're, you're bringing up what are the benefits and you're really, you're really, the, the lesson is let me bring them on the same side of the table with me. Bingo. So you're going to say, so let me tell you what we do. Martial arts is what, or commercial real estate is what the IRS lists us at. Let's put that over here, right? What we really do is we are a relationship-based company that works directly with your family to help guide your child through all of the stages. Your child, Ben, right now, I know you got an eight and 12 year old, this years ago, right? They're gonna currently go through the younger kid stage. Eventually there's the teenage years, which have different things, bullying, puberty, all that stuff. So we're gonna work directly with your family to help raise your child. So by the time they're 18 years old and it's time for college or it's time to go in the workforce, they're getting scholarships and they're the ones that are gonna get hired. So we do charge about $1,800 a month, but we are not a gym. We are going to help you raise your child and become leaders in this world so they can be an effective adult. Now, what's amazing is as soon as I stop talking about martial arts, which is 200 bucks a month, I'm talking about another item. So we taught gyms how to do that, and they went from charging $200 to upwards of $3,000 a month because we're helping raise your child. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to get you into a lease. If all we're doing is a lease, that's a bad relationship for us. What I'm looking for is your business to be as effective as possible. So we're working together for years and you never have to think of the property you're in. You show up, fresh coats of paint every couple of years, new carpet when you need it, everybody wins. If all I'm doing is offering you a lease, you can get that from anyone. We need to partner so your business grows. Love it. That is fantastic. We'll have to replay this clip in our office. I think that's I wonderful. Would. Great tip. Great tip. Let's talk about building confidence, something yep. you talk about. What are the tools and strategies for building confidence? Because I think our folks out there and everyone out in the ether, they're always wondering, and I get a lot of questions, Ben, how do I build confidence? How do I continue it? I have a bad day here. It just hits my self-esteem. Uh, someone called me a nasty thing and I can't, I'm not Teflon. I can't rub it off. That's why I hear from some of the folks out there. So give us your thoughts on confidence. Well, all confidence is a series of picture sounds and feelings that live inside of our head of how we feel about ourselves. So everything in life is based on past references. So when you show up to go play a sport, I play hockey, I usually show up as how I played at a prior time, depending which one, right? So I have an, a whole audio set on this I made years ago called Last Minute Confidence. I made it because there was last minute buns, like how to, or last, you ever did push ups? Right. Remember when you were younger, right. you're single, you did push ups before you went in the pool? Remember that? Right. When you or, were before kid, you went, or before you went on a date. Yeah, like, oh, push ups, right? <laughs> so I built Last Minute Confidence to like build last minute. It's like an old CD I, I, we have. You could go find it, you guys, out on the web if you can find it. Um, and like, and core confidence. Well, here's what confidence is confidence is, the feeling that we're capable of doing something and that we're in control of what we've done. So what if I told you it was access to a past reference, not our current activity? So let me ask you, Ben, what's something that you know that you're good at that you've done before? Uh, raising equity. Very good. For so our, For our properties. Is there a time that you did it that you are very proud of that like a moment where you were at in your life where you did that, where you stepped into it, you didn't know if you were going to do it right, and you pulled it off? Absolutely. It was the first deal I had to raise uh, millions of dollars for and had to go out. It, it And it only took me two weeks, which I look back and I'm wondering how did that ever happen? But I did it and we closed our first acquisition. Uh, it was a uh, industrial building in Chicago. I remember vividly. You see that smirk and, uh, about to come on your face? Yeah. Well, because I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud of it. I, I can reflect back and say uh, that, you know, 
I, at the time, I didn't have the confidence. You know, I didn't have the knowledge and have the confidence. I had to leverage into people, but I was so young and and naive and and maybe stupid. I had, I had no idea. Like what I wasn't worried about failure. You know, I said, yeah. okay, well, what would happen if I didn't raise the equity? Okay, well, I'm back to where I'm started. So what am I afraid of if I don't go out there with my shoe leather, throw on the suit, right, and meet a guy like Michael Burnoff and explain to him the benefits of this investment? And that's what I did. And I think it taught me a lot of lesson that, you know, get over your fear. Don't worry about it. I'm an introvert in an extrovert position. And I need to pull the trigger and get out there and take action. And that's what so I learned this, at a young age. Is this thing you're about to do, I would say to something, is it is it scary or is it something you have very limited experience with? Well, that particular example is both. I had limited okay. experience and it was. It was scary because you're talking to people with money that you're asking them to invest in a project that you have. And you're you're so concerned about looking like, this young kid is approaching me and I have, he has no experience and how is he going to make us money? And he, all I, all they see is potentially a, a, a downfall in the investment. That's what they see. And that's, that's the fear running through your head. Have you seen the Jetsons, the show when you were a kid? Of course. Remember Mr. Spacely's up on the desk and he's looking up at him, George, right? But Mr. Spacely yeah. was middle, right? right? So here's the interesting thing I'm going to tell you. If you think of people you admire, we always look up at them. Mm -hmm. So when I work with the UBS financial guys calling people with money in motion, they're calling a guy, he sold his stock, he's got 500 million bucks. And then that lead is sold on the open marketplace, that cell phone for like 500 bucks. I don't know if you know this existed, but there's, they get this number, they got three seconds on the phone. So what I always tell everyone is, whenever you look up at somebody, you're putting them on a pedestal and you're putting yourself on the ground. Most of our challenges we see, when I help do phobia cures with people, they, picture something up and big and scary, correct? So if you picture this billionaire guy, I bet you picture him up there. If you picture him in this little guy in your hand and you figure out what you're dealing with and like the IRS, you get a letter from the IRS in the mail. It's like, oh my God, this thing. And you start looking up. But if you picture this little like person in your hand as a cute little thing, you're less scared. So confidence has more to do with the positioning of where we put the thing we're scared of in our mind. So most people put it really large and big and up in the air versus down on the ground. It sounds ridiculous, but it's like, God, my wife's driving me nuts. Yeah, because you've got her right here in your head versus put her voice under your foot and go for a walk. Does that make sense? It's amazing. If your voice is under your foot and you keep on walking, eventually you won't hear it anymore or change the tone of the voice. So all confidence comes from thinking you're not in control of your circumstance. So the first thing we do is we change the language about it. Second thing we change is how we see it. So I would change the language. Someone says, God, I'm scared to call Bill. Okay, so you're uncomfortable having a conversation with somebody about something you're not used to talking about. Well, yeah, but yeah. Well, that is a different language. So also Bill, Bill's also scared too. Like in my very building, I had a couple of NHL guys a couple of years back. Uh, my buddy, uh, Darcy Hordacek, he plays a hockey player, played for, I don't know if you know who he was. He was here in the building, he goes, dude, Michael, I hired Tito Ortiz to help me with fights. And he goes, you know what I realized? The other person is just as scared to get punched. So I just hit him first because he's the one scared. And I popped him while he was still scared. So what most people don't realize is that thing you're scared to do, that other person's just as scared. Mike Tyson was scared out of his mind to get punched. He didn't want to get punched. He just acted like he wasn't. So this deal you're walking into, dude, some of these people are scared to say no or they're scared also. If you could choose to recognize that they're just as scared as you are, half the fear goes away. So you teach all these different lessons and one of your students is out in the world. Yep. What do you tell them to stay consistent in the strategy of staying consistent? Because let they come to one, they come to the Institute, it's in Scottsdale, yep. Arizona, you got this yep. beautiful facility and they walk away there and they say, okay, What's next? How, how do they stay consistent so they can incorporate this in their lives for, to Good create question. the success that you have created already? First, first, we, uh, first, we define what consistency is. For most people, it's all the time, every day, always. And what we do is we build levels. Most people, it's black and white, on or off. So we define what success is. Most people, success is closing a deal. And I'm like, okay, well, how many deals do you close a year? Like I have commercial real estate as well. I own properties and I love commercial. I, I totally get it. I just get it. Like, thank you. And I get it. Like I, 
I get, I get it. I mean, everyone should be involved with some level of commercial real estate. So for, let's say I'm dealing with a commercial real estate guy and maybe they do like three really large deals a year. Like I have a buddy, Tony in La Jolla, you know, he does campuses, huge campuses, right? He's make he might do one deal every 18 months. If he only feels success when he closes a deal, he's been miserable like 364 days a year. So we've got to define what success is. Like, do you get how crazy this is, right? Or even a, like, let's say a residential guy. I'm successful every, like they do three deals a month. Fine. You're happy 27 days a year. What about the rest of your life? So for me, I've redefined success and I stopped making it on or off. I made it optional. So success to me is I feel successful anytime I help someone or walk away from something I shouldn't be doing or work out or play hockey or learn something about myself or give someone a hug or help someone grow or close a deal or have an investment work or read a book. And I have made success mean so many things that I'm destined to feel it 30 to 40 times a day. I may only close eight deals a month, but it's not just about it or get a business card or do a great podcast or help somebody or learn something about myself or stop beating myself up or publish a book or close a deal or get someone a contract. So I have created or lifestyle, which is creating options for myself where most people, the reason they don't have consistency is they've got one way to win. And I have 9 million ways to win. I'm going to kill mm. you confidence and, 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 and it, cause every day I win 9,000 times. What do you mean by that? You win 9,000. Explain that to the audience. Well, I, I consider uh, doing this podcast a win. I consider okay. um, I consider getting my kid off to school a win. I consider, um, I consider I went for a run this morning a win. I consider closing a deal a win. I consider my business is better than it used to be a win. I consider that I paid the mortgage on the building and I only have 13 more years and the thing is already worth double what I bought it for. Every day I'm doing that type of stuff. So, um, so it's really, it's really taking action, but it's also taking a step back and being grateful for the things that you've done and saying, you know, my gratitude is a win and it's, yep. and I, and I'm taking actions in order to create that win. Is that, is that what you're saying? So let's say you're in commercial real estate. Let's say you're starting out. I know exactly mm -hmm. what you do when you start out. Let's say you're brand new in the old days before the internet, you used to drive the neighborhoods and remember you used to map it out. You know exactly right. what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. Remember? Oh yeah. You've been around this a long time, oh, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Map it out. You learn where the where the where the Starbucks are gonna well, it wasn't even Starbucks back then, like where the banks are, the gas right. stations you could flip right. into something else, right? So if you'd say, What are the ways to succeed? I'm successful anytime I hand out a business card or meet someone new or go on an appointment or close a deal or get a contract or 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 work with a bank um, or find an investor or read an audio, listen to an audio or read a book. I know reading a book and closing a deal are different, but they're both wins. And what most people need to recognize is how many wins can we accumulate in a day? And if you're always accumulating wins, you have no time to lose. Interesting. Interesting. What is, what is the best way to follow you for all these great nuggets of knowledge? I, I just, I really enjoy what you teach. Thank you. And I think, and I know that you can offer a lot of value to a lot of people with your teachings. And so what is the best way to follow you? To engage good, with you? good question. Uh, it depends how fast you want to move. So uh, number one is um, definitely should get the book, amazon.com or average sucks.com Instagram. Uh, you know, you posted something earlier. I'm posting a lot of stuff on there. Um, find me there. And if you're a serious student, I'm just going to tell you, like, if you're like, dude, I like this guy. Like I want to get in his head. Um, I have a website. It's called to actionnow.com. It's called the number two actionnow.com. It's five days working with me, kicking your butt, holding your hand. It's a couple hundred bucks. And if you're a serious student, I don't need to sell it to you. You got to do your own sales pitch on yourself if you want to grow, but it's designed to teach you how to communicate with you. And here's the coolest part. I do it over the phone, not on wow. zoom. And here's why the most underrated asset we have is our ability to listen to talk and to control our inner dialogue. So it's like taking a martial artist, I have a $100,000 studio here and I don't use it for that on purpose because I'm almost like I wanna blindfold a martial artist because if you can fight blindfolded, imagine how good you can do in the blindfold off. So I put people in auditory mode so they can notice what they're saying, how they're listening and how they're receiving the information. So when they take it out in the world, you have a strategic advantage. It's such a great place to start. So 
calltoactionnow.com. It's half price for this group. It's, but It's only 200 bucks for five it's, days. It's, three, it's 300 bucks. I, here's That's why a I bargain. Do it. it, it's, it's embarrassing to do, but here's why. <laughs> if I was a drug dealer, it's my dime bag. I'm going to get right. you hooked. Does that right. make sense? And it's yeah. going to be so valuable that you're going right. to be like, oh my God, this is amazing. What else you got? I need so, more. Be careful, be careful taking advantage of it because you All will right. have a better life. That sounds great. We're going to, we're going to wrap up with our three oh, questions. Right. We asked our guests and, sure. and uh, I'm excited to hear your answers uh, knowing who you are. So the Don't, first question is, yeah. uh, uh, here we go. <laughs> the first question is we, in our, I own it studios, which you don't see today, we have a couch and I would say, Michael lay on the couch. Now the problem is you're six, seven, you might be, halfway off the couch when you lay down, Fine. but, but so you're laying on the couch and I say, Michael, uh, close your eyes and you're, uh, and you are who you are now, this wildly successful coach and it's influenced to help millions of people. And you look back and you, you are, you have the moment to talk to your 16 year old self. What are you telling your 16 year old self knowing what you know now and the experiences you've been through? Yep. Real simple. Uh, stop lying to yourself and telling uh, telling yourself that other people are supposed to have those things, go get what you want. So you are already capable of having it. Stop pretending that that stuff is for other people. It's yours if you want it. That's, I, I feel like you're, that's coming out of my mouth. That was, that was fantastic. That girl you want to date, you can. That that's right. team you want to make, you can. And stop pretending you can't have that video game system because you can, you either need to influence your parents to buy it or go rake some yards. Okay. It's your last day on earth. God forbid you and I are sitting down having a meal together. What are we eating? Sushi. Okay. What are we washing that down with? Um, well, I drink water and green tea. I don't drink alcohol, but other people might. Well, this is your water. this is your last day on earth. I mean, I like can, green. You, I love good green tea. Um, yeah. I love okay. I love Penta water. I got to push Penta water. My friend Kara Hint water. I love Hint water. That's my favorite. What so is Penta friend, water? There is Penta. Like Penta alkaline? is uh, it's fancy preppy water. It's like highly alkalized. Uh, okay. It's incredible. It's purity water. And Hint nice. is flavored water. My friend Kara owns the company. If you don't know Kara, I'll introduce you. But it's a billion dollar Fantastic. brand. In the Ionis Studios, we have a grand piano, uh, a drum set, and six electric guitars. If we could have any musician or band play in the studio with you and I, okay, and you'll have to come to Laguna Beach next time, okay, is they could be deceased or living. Who would you want in the studio with us playing us a song? This is a tough one because I have a bunch of people I can say. Sure. Um, I, uh, I love Metallica. Um, okay. A lot. So I would love Metallica. Uh, Metallica or Guns N' Roses back in the day. Those are my childhood yeah. uh, go-tos. Um, we would love some um, From Whom the Bell Tolls or Master of Puppets. Did you have a mullet when you were a little bit? Oh, uh, no. no. I, had a, I had a flat, I had like a spike hair thing. Oh, like really? A, okay. Like, like, like <laughs> I had spiky hair when I was right. a kid with, the, with level nine depth. Well, you had to be, I mean, Bon Jovi was pretty big where you grew up, bon wasn't it? Yeah, I love Bon Jovi, Van yeah. Halen, any yep. of that stuff. A chip yeah. behind the camera would, would joke back and forth. He'd like David Lee Roth, but I like Sammy Hagar better. Oh, yeah, I like both of them. I mean, David was kind of crazy, but Sammy was, he took that band to another level, so. He's, his, his book was incredible, too. Red, you should read his book. It's incredible. Yeah, I heard it's fantastic. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, for coming on today. What, what a wealth of knowledge and real Thank privilege, you. Michael Burnoff. It was great seeing you and uh, stay, stay cool. I know it's a little warm down there right now. A couple more months. Now. Yeah, but you'll be okay. And if you are interested in uh, watching the I Own It podcast, hit that subscribe button on the lower right-hand screen of YouTube and feel free to follow me at benreinberg.com. For any information you need on wealth, health, relationships, and especially business, feel free to log on to our company website, AllianceCGC.com. And if you're interested in investing in our brand new fund, we just launched the Alliance Medical Property Fund. Because just remember, folks, the human body is never going out of style. And you can make money just like Ben Reinberg does. So feel free to log on to our company website for more information. And Michael Burnoff, Thank you so much for joining us today. 
we wanted you on the show. You know why? Because you own it. And when you. you own it, success gets created and you make an impact on the world. So thank you very much, Michael, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for listening to the I Own It podcast with Ben Reinberg. To hear our past episodes and connect with Ben, visit BenReinberg.com.